I kind of have three, three steps here. So the first thing I want to do is talk about what I actually mean by safe learning experiences. Because I think we uh, might kind of come in, uh, have different interpretations of, of what those words mean. Um, and then the next thing that I'll do is talk a little bit about why this is important and why I think it's something that you should think about. One of the biggest parts of my role as a technical trainer at New Relic is to make sure that new hires have uh, the technical uh, competence and, and also confidence uh, to be self-sufficient as they continue to learn on their job. And when I started, I thought that the technical knowledge part of that was the most important. Uh, but the more uh, that I, the, the longer I was in the position, I kind of realized that confidence was the biggest hurdle, and that was the thing that made the most sense uh, to address, uh, to, to spend the most time on. So starting from, starting from helping, helping my friends uh, in classes in school, uh, to uh, coordinating a um, an, uh, science outreach program for, for, young, uh, for young students uh, taught by university students, uh, and uh, to doing the technical training at New Relic and helping out with uh, as a co-organizer of the Pi Ladies local group in Portland, Oregon. So the reason I, I wanted to kind of lay that all out is that even though I've spent all of this time working on helping other people learn, I make mistakes a lot uh, in making the learning experience safe for people. And so I think that is probably the thing that qualifies me most to tell you about this is learning from the mistakes that I've made in the past. Okay, so what do I mean by a learning experience? So this isn't really very specific. Uh, I think that it's just any time somebody might learn something. So that could be uh, like a formal classroom experience. Uh, it could be the training that you receive at work. Um, it could be uh, maybe pair, pair programming with one of your coworkers or giving a presentation at a conference, maybe a workshop that you're leading at a community event. So all of those things, um, or even just, even just a conversation, all of those things are learning experiences uh, where learning is happening. Uh, okay. So what do I mean by how do we make learning experiences safe? So I think this is probably the, 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 uh, the point of where there could be the most confusion. So if you are able and willing, uh, I'd like for you to help me out with a little demonstration. Uh, so uh, consider if you've ever learned something before. So if you have ever learned something before, uh, please stand up. <laughs> so. <laughs> this is a bit of a control because I think being at a uh, at a PyCon, uh, being at PyCon, I think we've probably all learned many things. Um, so if you're not standing now, I think that you're probably just opting out of that, and that's okay. Um, okay, so now that you're all standing, I want you to think about if those learning experiences you've had in the past have ever been uncomfortable, if you've ever had any doubt in the face of something that you've had to learn, um, if you've ever experienced some frustrating, some, uh, some frustration, if you've ever wanted to quit. So if none of those things have ever happened to you, please sit down. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I thought. <laughs> okay, you can all sit down now. So. I think, I think you all know what I mean by safe learning experiences. When, when those things that I mentioned happen, sometimes that can be motivating and sometimes that's really good. Uh, I think frustration is a great motivator. It makes me want to keep going. Uh, it makes the rewards greater. But there is a significant possibility uh, that, that those experiences could turn somebody off learning something that they want to learn or could greatly slow down the pace of their learning. And so that's why I think um, uh, we need to, to be aware of when learning experiences are safe or not. So I'm not talking about physical safety now. Um, as a trainer and educator and kind of community builder, um, I obviously think about these things a lot. Um, and so the next, the next part of this talk will be why I think that you should think about them as well. So one of the things is uh, your success. So uh, is anybody working on or planning to work on in the future some kind of a tutorial or talk or class or uh, maybe some mentoring for one of their coworkers? Yeah? So um, 
I think some of the things that I'll talk about later will help you be successful in that. And so that's one of, one of the reasons you should care. Uh, the next thing is uh, your collaborators, your future collaborators. So when we, um, when learning experiences are not safe for certain types of people, we're basically filtering out a part of our community, right? We're, we're, we're basically, we're, we're, we're putting up a hurdle for certain types of people. Um, and so you're kind of deciding who you're gonna be able to collaborate with in the future, who's gonna be part of your community. And uh, that also becomes a vicious cycle. So when you, um, when those unsafe learning experiences exclude certain types of people, it's harder and harder for those people to come into the community later. Which then leads to a problem with uh, groupthink, right? So if the people around you are all a certain type of people, you'll probably think about problems in the same way. And then you kind of miss out on uh, the possible diversity in thinking styles that might help you uh, see something that your, your group is blind to. And um, so I have, a, I have an example of this for me that I always have to look out for. Uh, and, and I think often the hardest, this is the hardest when you feel excluded yourself. So I'm a very visual kind of graphical thinker. Like I like to see diagrams and charts. I like to make connections between things. And so sometimes when words are the only thing that's available for me to learn from, that's a little challenging. Uh, and so when I find other people who think the same way and we can communicate through diagrams with each other, it's really, really exciting. Um, and so then it's kind of tempting to kind of clump together with those people and then forget about people who also need, need words uh, or other, um, other or, 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 or doing something, practice to learn. Um, so that's, that's my personal, that's my thing that I have to work on. And I, and I bet you could think of something um, that's like that for you as well. And then so uh, the, I think the, the most important thing though is, is something that Naomi talked about a lot yesterday. So thank you um, for your talk. Um, the Python community is already really good at this. Um, and I think that means that we are in a good position to become even better at it. And so uh, for the rest, of, uh, the rest of the talk, I'll talk about some ways that you can do this. Uh, and uh, Depending on where you're at, what your experience is uh, in doing this in the Python community, this might mean that the rest of the talk is, congratulations, you're already doing these things, so awesome, high five. Uh, it could be that you're already doing some of these things, but you'll get a few more ideas uh, for ways that you can make your events more inclusive. Um, and maybe this isn't some, or the, the last possibility is maybe this isn't something that you have thought about a lot before, and so uh, can be kind of an introduction to thinking about it. Uh, in the future. Okay, so still, still no slides, huh? <laughs> it's a learning yeah. So if I were, <laughs> I, I feel for some of you in the audience because if I were in the audience and there wasn't something to look at, I would be really frustrated right now. So thanks for bearing with me on that. Okay, so so uh, I kind of have three areas to talk about. So the first is being inclusive, which you've heard about before, uh, minimizing uncertainty, um, and also addressing prior experience. So I'm gonna kind of use those three categories to talk about some specific things that you can do. Okay, so minim uh, I'm actually gonna start with, oh wait, this is disorienting. <laughs> Um, okay, minimizing uncertainty. So uh, this is my first time visiting Ireland. Um, I'm uh, from Portland, Oregon in the US. Uh, one of the first things I noticed when I got here at the airport was the look left and look right signs on the street. I hadn't seen that before. Um, I thought that was really cool. Uh, as somebody who didn't really want to have to think about which way the traffic was going as I was trying to find the bus that I needed to take to get to my hotel, uh, that was amazing. So later I had a, a conversation with my, one of my coworkers about what that says about people in the city. That like, does it mean that people can't figure out how the traffic is going even though they see it every day? So I was like, well, that's interesting. Well, my take on it was way different, right? Like my take on it was like, that was super helpful. That was exactly what needed to be there. Uh, when there's a potential hazard that you could run into, uh, you shouldn't make it complicated for somebody to find the information that they need to get 
to avoid that hazard. Um, and but I think that my coworkers kind of thought about that as a common is a common one about learning experiences as well. That you know, uh, if you make things too easy for people, it's kind of insulting. But I don't think that that's true. I think that it's really helpful. Okay, so that's uh, yeah. So one of the so that kind of addresses being aware of the, the cognitive load that you're putting on people when, when they're faced with learning. So if there's a lot of work that somebody has to do uh, just to figure out uh, the, uh, the basics of what's going on, uh, it's going to be harder for them to learn the more complicated things. So as simple as you can make it for somebody, the easier it is, the safer it is for them to avoid the hazards uh, that might cause them problems later. Uh, so part of this is considering the timing of uh, informational complexity. So uh, this would be a lot easier to demonstrate with a slide, but uh, one of the examples that I have for this is in teaching people to learn Git. So uh, who uses Git on a regular basis? Okay, so I'll explain a little bit because not everybody raised their hands. So, um, <clears throat> so Git is a version control tool uh, that um, a lot of us use. Uh, when we're coding, uh, to keep, keep track of changes and, and to collaborate with each other. And it has a, if you raise your hand, you're probably aware that it has a pretty steep learning curve, especially for somebody who's brand new to programming at all and the command line interface at all. Um, and so when we do classes for PyLadies and when I uh, help people learn this at work, I try to go really slow and keep the steps really simple. And <laughs> one of the things that happens sometimes is I get a hand raised up. It's like. You know, you can combine those two steps into one command, and it's you know it's much less typing. It's like, yeah, you're right. But for all of the other people in this group who haven't seen this before, that's really confusing. Uh, so when somebody's learning something for the first time, I think it's really helpful to break out steps into simple steps. And that's even if you have more steps there, that's actually less complex because it's easier to see what's going on. Okay, so the other thing that you can do here to minimize uncertainty, one of the things somebody might be uncertain about is uh, whether they're on the right track, uh, whether they're doing something right. And so one thing you can do uh, is build in tests. Right? That's something we should be doing all the time, right? Uh, so uh, what I mean by this is uh, if you follow this step, uh, an example is here's a step to do. Um, once you've done this step, this is what you should see. Uh, and then that gives the learner, the person who's learning, some kind of context for whether or not they were successful. And I think that that's really, really helpful. Uh, even better if you can say, if you don't see this, um, if you're not, if you're not following along, if you're not um, on track, here are some resources that you can access to help you get back on track. Um, another thing that's uh, come up a lot, uh, especially with Pi Ladies, uh, for me, is giving very clear instructions in advance. Uh, so we do a lot of uh, workshops about um, uh, different Python topics and uh, getting dev environments set up. Uh, and I, I think somebody mentioned, I think somebody mentioned yesterday that, that that's one of the big hurdles in, in getting into, into Python is, is kind of navigating installing everything and getting everything set up. Um, so when we give clear instructions in advance, it helps people understand the scope of what they're be, well, they'll be doing and what they'll be able to do after, after the learning experience. Um, I think one, uh, e e even, even details like um, if it's important to be on time uh, are really helpful. Um, if something is going to happen uh, before the event starts are really helpful. Um, an example I'd have is uh, in our Portland PyLadies group, we have a regular event that meets on Saturdays uh, at a coffee shop. So we all bring our laptops to the coffee shop and, and basically kind of hang out and, and talk to each other about what we're working on. It's very social and it's, it's kind of uh, set up to be a drop-in event. Um, but despite our efforts that we, we thought we were being clear about what, how the event worked, we, uh, we used to get a lot of questions about is it okay if I'm, if I'm a half an hour late? Uh, do I need to bring a laptop? 
Um, and so those, it's not always obvious right away just exactly what information people need to know about a learning experience coming into it. And so it, if you're aware of those kinds of questions and continue to address them, you'll get a lot of good practice at getting better at having clear instructions in advance. Okay, so uh, that was minimizing uncertainty. The next kind of section I wanna talk about is um, being inclusive. So I think the biggest challenge about this one is even when we think that we're being inclusive sometimes, it's, it's really hard to see the way that we're subtly in excluding people. And those things aren't always a big deal the first time they happen, um, or one time they happen, but they kind of add up over time. Um, so that's, that's a big challenge. So uh, one example of this is um, cultural references. Uh, so I had, and, and so these can be, these can be really helpful in kind of engaging your audience and, and kind of building a sense of community. If you have a good sense of uh, what your community, who your community is, right? It's, but there's, it's very easy to, uh, to kind of miss out on a section of people who don't really feel included by that cultural reference. And so I had an example here of, uh, we had a, um, a community Python event in Portland a couple of weeks ago. And the logo for the event uh, was, a, was a really cool uh, drawing of a, of a Python uh, holding a cup of coffee with uh, uh, dark rimmed uh, glasses uh, and a, uh, a tattoo with the name of the conference on it. And so in Portland, that's kind of like the stereotype of the Portland hipster, and it's something that people, you know, they relate to. Um, if, if I showed that here, I'm not really sure if that would have gotten picked up, right? And so kind of understanding both whether people will understand what the cultural reference is and how they'll feel about it. Both of those things kind of go into deciding whether that makes sense for your learning experience or not. Okay, um, so when, when I'm, especially when I'm a little unsure about uh, what, the, what the experience level is of the audience that I'm talking to, um, and, and especially when I think maybe they know more about me or, or more about the thing than I do, I might say something like, oh, you all know about this, right? Like, you, you already know this, right? Uh, when, when you're in an audience and you don't know it and you hear that, it's kind of hard. It's, it feels kind of exclusive. So that sends the message that you're expected to know that thing to be in the room or to be reading the tutorial or to be talking to the person. So a better way to kind of get a feel for whether people understand or, or what background people have um, is, um, does anyone not know about this, right? Is, do I need to address this? And that works really well when you're in a safe, in a safe environment where you know that people feel pretty comfortable. Uh, but when you think people still might not speak up in that situation, um, when it still might be hard for somebody to raise their hand and say that they don't know something, um, you might want to just go ahead and explain it. Uh, so especially, so anything that you think uh, might be unfamiliar or ambiguous, uh, it, like, a, like an acronym or some jargon or a term that, is, uh, that has multiple meanings, uh, it's helpful to just tell them what you mean instead of uh, asking whether you need to tell them. So usually that doesn't take too long, and it usually also doesn't really bore your audience. It's kind of, uh, uh, often you think it might, uh, but I don't think it usually does. Okay, and so the last thing I'd say about being inclusive is that um, being inclusive really isn't enough. I think that you should really strive to be welcoming. Uh, and so um, some, here are some examples of some things that I've seen recently uh, that were really welcoming. So at a, a, a conference I went to, we talked. To, we've we've heard about how co how important code of conducts are, and they're really important in the Python community. Um, at an event I went to recently, they actually summarized the code of conduct at the beginning of the event, which I thought was really cool. So um, remember, everyone, that this is something that we care about. <laughs> um, I think showing appreciation for people just showing up is really helpful. So. Uh, and, and that's, a, that's a contribution, right? So somebody just showing up is contributing to the community. Um, another thing uh, 
that you can do is be aware of whether your location is accessible to people. Uh, so, so I mentioned our, our Pi Ladies weekend event, uh, which is at a coffee shop, and we hadn't, we hadn't, we all kind of liked it because they had good food, they had good Wi-Fi, it worked really well. Well, one day um, we had a woman in a wheelchair show up, and uh, the, it wasn't very wheelchair accessible. There was no ramp on the door, and there was a little bit of a bump, but she came anyway, which I thought was really, really cool. Um, she told me that she had. Uh, gone by the location beforehand to scope out whether she was going to be able to go. Uh, and it was a little, she needed a little bit of help to get into the, into the uh, venue, but she did it anyway, which I think maybe a lot of people wouldn't do. Uh, and so that was a really big kind of wake up call. That's like, maybe we need to think a little bit harder about the venues that we're using to make sure that uh, all of the people we want to come are going to be able to come. And that could be also distance. Um, if there's, uh, if you can do something slightly different uh, to make um, uh, a live event easier for somebody to get to just um, geographically, that could help a lot as well. I think also uh, just acknowledging people, uh, saying something like, I see you, is really helpful. Um, when somebody feels like, especially when you're kind of going over something and somebody has a question um, that you can't address right away, just, to, just noticing them um, makes them feel very welcome and part of the group. Okay, so I, um, I, don't wanna, I don't want to give you the impression that I think that you need to appeal to every type of person and everything that you do, right? That's not very realistic, um, and that would, that would make it hard to get a lot of things done. Uh, so sometimes it does make sense to appeal to particular groups rather than than everyone, um, and so in those cases, it's really it's really important to just be very clear about what the group is that you're addressing. And so that's part of what I mean by addressing prior experience. Okay, so one of the questions here um, is, uh, what is a beginner? So a lot of times we talk about whether something is for a beginner or not, uh, but that's kind of a complicated word. Um, so <clears throat> you, might, you might know of uh, Zed Shaw, who, uh, among other things, wrote a, a book called Learn Python the Hard Way. Um, it's, it's very basic, and it kind of, it, it's like, follow these instructions. Just follow these instructions. Um, and he wrote um, um, a blog recently um, about beginners versus early coders, and I think it's, I think it's a really good read. Um, basically, the idea is that absolute beginners were kind of being ignored, and so the purpose of his book was to um, address those absolute beginners who had no experience with, um, with programming at all. Whereas most of the other um, things that were labeled beginner really kind of expected you to be coming in with some knowledge. Um, I think especially in technology, and it's, it's hard to remember the things that you didn't know when you started, because you learn really fast and everything builds on itself. And so it's super, super, super easy to forget what you didn't know. So uh, in order to figure out what you didn't know, uh, it's easy enough to just talk to somebody who, has, has, who doesn't have experience with that, and that can kind of help you understand what you're missing. So, so that could kind of help you figure out uh, how to address beginners and intermediates or advanced. But I think that that, that, um, that terminology, beginner, intermediate, advanced, is uh, too coarse in almost all cases. And so I think that a better way to address that would be to uh, talk about the prerequisites or the, uh, the, the information, the knowledge that you expect people to have coming into uh, the learning experience. And so I actually think there's a really good example of this in Larry Hastings' talk description uh, about the, the Python's infamous skill yesterday. Uh, so take a look at that. There's a really cool example of that in there. Okay, so another way that you can uh, address uh, prior, no prior experience is to be vulnerable yourself and show your own mistakes. So one of the things that's really hard being a, a, a very new person is that it seems like the person, the people that you have to learn from never make any mistakes, and it's, it always works. And, but you see all these problems happening and all of these bugs um, and all of these errors. Um, and uh, so uh, 
it feels like that distance is very far and uh, maybe uh, impossible. But as somebody who's, who's teaching or helping somebody learn, if you can show, just, just let someone see the mistakes that you make and how you get yourselves out of them. Um, that's a really good learning experience. And it helps you learn together with, with the people around you as opposed to kind of a uh, unidirectional uh, transfer of, of knowledge.